Hello there, Sarah from 17 once again. This is my Mass Effect Andromeda Insanity Difficulty video walkthrough. This is going to be the way home, uh, Meridian. To begin this mission, we have to first search out three of these clusters so that we can uh, get information. I think it's on the Scourge. I couldn't quite read the text there because the, the preview window is low resolution. But you're going to go to three areas in, in the system. You're going to do some scanning and it's going to uh, give us the coordinates or give us the capacity to get to where we need to go. I can't remember the, the exact details. Once you've done that, it's probably going to lead to one of those team missions. And uh, this is one of the rare moments where I've left in the, the, the space menu stuff. It's to show you me going to the planets and picking up the uh, anomalies and what have you. I've done this for kind of posterity reasons, to make sure that the guide makes sense. Uh, it's not my intention to, to bore you with arguably one of the weaker areas of this game, once you get past, you know, the facial animations and the dialogue and the story and all the other things that people have complained about for, for quite a large amount of time now. But there are those moments sometimes in walkthroughs where people ask those amazing questions and if you'd have left in certain pieces of footage, maybe those questions wouldn't have been asked. And uh, I'm doing this hopefully to, to pay it forward so that people uh, don't get confused. And uh, I don't mean to, to patronise anybody. I, I know you are capable of finding Meridian on your own. It's probably just the combat that you've come to this video for. And if I can be some aid and some use to you there, that's awesome. But uh, I've learnt over my time on YouTube that you should never, ever, ever underestimate people. Um, the questions you thought no human being could ask, I've been asked. And they were not in it with irony involved, so it's it's an interesting place, the internet. So I'm just going to roll with it, and we're going to have a good time. I'm curious too. Do you think this game's going to get DLC? Because didn't every Mass Effect get DLC? And wasn't the DLC always kind of underwhelming? You know, they weren't bad, but they weren't great. They introduced this, but they didn't do that. You know, the kind of the kind of thing that you compliment, but then you always immediately counter argue it. I wonder if this game will do something that, that, you know, really, really picks it up in the eyes of people. Because at the moment in time, uh, the game itself is... I don't think it's as horrible as people are saying, but I, it's definitely unacceptable when it comes to, you know, how long it's been developed and the fact that this is the fourth game in the series and it, you know, it lacks a lot of the features that made those first three really good. Ooh, and we got to level up from doing the space stuff, which is... I think that's a nice feature, that, getting the XP from doing the planetary stuff. And they did, they did actually patch the space travel, so you don't have to watch all of those vignettes every time they happen. And let's face it, nobody wants to watch this. I can understand, you know, from the perspective of an artist who's designed these fantastic little parallaxing galaxy pans, but, you know, once you've done it once, you don't want to do it again. And there's this entire universe of planets to look at, but you have to watch this every time you do it. You spend more time watching the transition than you do interacting with the planet. And... I think there's a really important lesson there, uh, if it is interns that made this game or, you know, people who are not that experienced with video games, there's a really, really good lesson there in my opinion. And it's this idea that if you spend more time doing something that isn't the thing you're supposed to be doing, then maybe the balance of gameplay is off. And that needs to be worked on because... That is the, the truest form of, of design, isn't it? This this beautiful understanding of balance, this this symbiosis between systems where you're always having fun. Because the moment that you lose that, or the moment you lose that player, they might turn your game off and trade it in. You need to keep them there in those systems, in those mechanics, in that world. And to do that, you've got to try really hard these days. There's a lot of bright colours, there's a lot of distractions. Everybody's on Instagram these days, you know, they're obsessed. Tinder's taking over the planet with swiping, judging people face on face values and swiping accordingly, and then stealing a friend's phone and swiping all the ugly ones. Like, it's... We're fighting for attention all the time, so when it comes to video games, you better have all the bells and whistles, because if you don't, no one's going to give a shit. But speaking of shit, this is a tough fight. There is a lot of observers here, and the cover's not the best, so what I'm going to do here, folks, is I'm going to get up on this pillar, and I'm going to try and make sure that nothing flanks me, and if it does, I'm going to shit my pants and hope I live. Because that's pretty much what you're going to be watching, because this gets rough, and if you fall down, there's probably liquid waiting to melt your shield off. 
but for the most, you have a really strong position here. It's a vantage point, and as long as your team push forward, they will keep them occupied, and then you can do some uh, devastation. There is a nullifier. He's going to knock you out of cover. I'm being flanked. I'm being flanked. Quick, Chris, you're being flanked. There you go. Take him out. Do a couple hits. Do a big ground pound. No, no ground pound? Damn. Then again, this is on Insanity. You don't want to do any kind of melee stuff on Insanity unless you've got a build that rewards that. And the Cryo Gauntlet's fantastic, but I don't have a build that, that really rewards it. So, they pushed a little bit aggressive. We got a little jacked. Here comes another Observer. Get that shield off immediately. Get your team aiming at it and try and get back up on the middle if you can because it's a really strong position. I know there's a Nullifier to my left, but he's not a threat compared to the Observer. The Nullifier is just like a, a, an, an awful fly who keeps buzzing around your face. But he's not all that dangerous, it's the other dude that's dangerous. So, focus on the danger, know that you're safe from the nullifiers, because all they do is they exist to make you swat at them so you don't see the thing that kills you. And now there's only two nullifiers left, so this phase is, is going to be pretty damn quick. And then we have the next fight, which I believe is really tricky as well. And a confusing fight too, so I'm going to discuss that. The next room, you open the doors that are in front of us now. And it's just a ton of dudes in a room, a big room that's got all kinds of crazy architecture and design going on that you're not going to use because it's going to be so quick, you're not going to need to. And then, oh, he kicked me. What a bitch. He kicks me in the face. Get him, boys. Get him, Drac. Go on. Do more reloading with a shotgun than anything else, but it is powerful. So this next room is, is tough. It's, it's a really tricky room with bad cover and a lot of enemies, but once you kill everything, if you run to the gravity well, you don't have to do the second spawn of the fight, and the second spawn of the fight seems way more interesting than the first one. So you kill everything, which is a big amalgamation of all the enemies you've been encountering, and then they spawn one of those, you know, what are they called, like Devastators? I forget the name of them. You know the big robot machine gun guy? And then there's a fiend with it too. So it's two, like, heavy, ultra-class enemies at the same time in a really unique room, and you don't even have to do it. You can completely skip it. And I didn't even know that it was a wave, because every time I've done this, I've hit the gravity well, they've spawned in, and I've already been gone. So it's one of those uh, super weird aspects of, of video games, and I tell a lie, folks, it isn't this room. It's the room coming up. It's this room. I believe. So... Or maybe it's the room after this. Because we're transitioning to playing as the sister now, and you'll notice that my sister is a, a random Chinese woman. But it's cool because she's really good with the pistol. So that room that I was talking about, folks, is coming up in a moment. Um, when we get there, I'll point it out. At this moment, you just want to go to the weapon locker, pick up your pistol, and uh, appreciate that this lady doesn't have too many powers, but then you're not expected to do too much on this sequence coming up. But I've spoke about this on previous videos. I find this area to be very jarring. It's a, a really strange thing. Like right then, I didn't mean to throw a grenade. I meant to throw a move I've been doing for the entire duration of the campaign, but now I'm playing with somebody else, I forget that it's a different fun function. And it just it feels weird to me. It feels really weird. Like, they give you a gun you've probably never used, which is just like random scrub pistol off Mass Effect 2 that nobody played with. And then they expect you to do some really just standard, generic firefights that don't stand out at all. Uh, the only thing that really stands out is how quick they kill you and how slow you kill them because you're using this garbage pistol. But it's just this, like, it's such a, a shift of tempo. We've just come from a massive firefight in a room against the most tough enemies in the game, jumping around pillars, you know, getting knocked out of cover as the entire team coming together and coalescing into this vision of violence and conquest. And then immediately swap to playing as somebody who you've never really paid that much attention to unless you, you were super into the sister angle of the story, and then do this super standard, like, prologue tier shooting gallery. It's a really strange shift of pace, and it's just when the game was getting a lot of momentum too, and usually a moment like this would, would heighten, you know, the tension, it would add to that, that escalation, but I just don't think it does. I always find this moment to be very jarring. Um, I, I feel like they wanted us to have this emotional resonance with what's happening because we spent a lot of time on this ship, so we know about it, and it's now being attacked by this, you know, this only new threat in this new universe, or new system or galaxy, or whatever, not universe, technically. And, and I just, I just don't. I don't feel it. I don't feel the, the, what there should be, pretty much. You know, I don't feel the stakes at all.
and it looks like I've been messing about with both enabled aim assist and disabled aim assist because if you remember at the beginning of the walkthrough I gave people an idea of an advantage that you might have when it comes to how sticky the auto aim can be so uh, this is one of the moments where I was experimenting flicking it on and off uh, I did that a few times throughout the, the recording and um, I've come to the conclusion that I prefer, I prefer the game when it's off so definitely something worth looking into but there's not that many fights left and then we can go back to playing as a rider and we can get back into the, the real encounters because the only thing that's going to kill you here is overconfidence because you're not really doing anything interesting you're just kind of pushing through this area and um, they're giving you the illusion of tension the illusion of, of, of dire consequences but then it's not really reflected much in the story at all it's, it's an interesting moment what did you think about this moment guys did you like it did it do what you needed it to do um, there's no point in fighting this encounter because you it takes far too long to do you just want to skip it there's a lot of anointed just boost just get past it and then the moment that you touch the I think is it the Sam nodule that you have to restart um, you can get back into the proper game but I think this could have been an interesting tool because you know if you kept flitting between the sister and the brother and the sister and the brother and that was actually an established mechanic I think that could have been really interesting and, and a really fun sequence but it's just it's too sudden and it doesn't explain itself it doesn't like validate existing to me so it's one of those weird moments uh, we're back in the game we're pushing forward we're going down the gravity well if you're wondering what weapons I'm using and you've not followed the walkthrough this is a scorpion and I also have the is it the darn shotgun it's uh, a shotgun scorpion combination one is explosive with radius damage the other one is an incredibly powerful two-shot shotgun and I am a sentinel that uh, uses a lot more biotics than tech for whatever reason it's just the way I play I guess on this particular run but is, is this the, the door that I wanted to to warn people of because the room that I talked about earlier that leads to that spawn that you don't have to fight the best cover is standing outside the room it's really annoying and I don't think we're just there yet so back onto the the ship once we've hit that doorway uh, we now have to to do the objective and then we can actually land on Meridian and it's <laughs> it needs to be told guys I got a, a game breaking bug on on landing on Meridian if you skipped the cutscenes I don't know if they've patched this but it was in the patch notes that they were going to address it if you skip the cutscene too quickly at the beginning of the Meridian level uh, you will get put into like a, a an endlessly falling animation it's this crazy falling bullshit thing and then if you if you get to actually control the game and move forward if you die it puts you back into the bullshit falling animation so you can't continue the game unless you do it perfectly and it happened to me about five times it was really frustrating but here is uh, my favorite part of the game I thought this part was really really cool it gave me goosebumps because it's the idea of everything that you've influenced in this new frontier is now coming together putting all their differences aside to kind of do this one big hit on this final area and I love the feeling of, of amassing a big army it reminds me of Mass Effect 2 you know when you did all the loyalty missions so you had everybody coming in and, and helping out and it's a really cool Mass Effect moment it's, it's like the end of Mass Effect 1, there was another sequence that was quite similar to that. Like, It's vintage Mass Effect in, in the weakest Mass Effect. But this place looks beautiful too. Even on Xbox One this place looks really nice. Just, I love all the vegetation, I love the, the blue sky. You know, I think it's, this is one of the places where I, I wish we could spend more time in it. Because this is an aspect of the world building that I really fell for. You know, it really just ticked all the boxes. But there's a couple of firefights coming up here. And uh, you That's need to be aware of them. Not the Hyperion. So let's have a see. So it's just some basic driving at this point. No, really. what Which leads me to, to talk about a, a topic that somebody mentioned in the comments. And uh, I replied sure to it, but I want to discuss it in the video. Because I think it was a really good observation that the guy made. So all the way through this walkthrough, I've talked about how this game fosters this active battlefield. This idea that a lot of the enemies will rush you fundamentally and they force you to move, they force you to put yourself into different spots and you can't just sit in one piece of cover and be safe. And throughout this walkthrough I've praised that element of it. But in my Uncharted 4 walkthrough, the game does a very similar thing and in that game uh, I wasn't so kind to that particular design. And he wanted to, to know why this was as we uh, break down in the car and we're about to fight some baddies. So, you know, get your guns on and, and do your best. And um, just be careful. There's, there's a couple of anointed here that will end you quicker than anything else in the game. Everybody else is kind of gravy though. 
You just keep pushing forward. You can do this, you've got this far, you're going to be fine. So, in Andromeda, the enemies generally will stay at a decent distance from you. They'll stay in a position of advantage, which is near cover, or uh, in, a, in, a, in, in elevation, or, or, or trying to get to a point where they can rush you because your cover's not so good. Fundamentally, the Chosen will try to flank. The Chosen will sit there sometimes, they'll move between rocks, and if they think they can get a good advantage of you, they'll try and flank, just like Mr. Anointed did then. The Anointeds always rush you, always flank. It's how they're designed. The, the Destins will very lazily, almost casually, golf walk towards you, but never fully rush you in any kind of meaningful way. The only way that they're ever really a threat is if you put yourself in a bad spot because they don't seem to quite have understood how to do it like the Chosens or how to do it like the Anointeds. So they're just kind of there. But the combination of these things and the other factors leads to a very lethal battlefield of people putting pressure on you from different angles. But Andromeda deals with this fantastically because the levels themselves are designed in such a way that there's generally always a kind of cover regardless of where you are that should save your ass if you need it. If you can jump up the right and grab the ledge, that is. And if there isn't, you are always one dash or one jump dash away from getting out of the range of people. Because they, the way they've increased the mobility in this game, you have no excuse to get caught in the open anymore because you are just, if not more so, versatile, durable and flexible with your movements than any of the enemies can be. So you have this trump card of whenever shit starts to go bad, even on insanity where you die very quickly, you can get out of there quick enough and put yourself in a better spot. This allows for the dynamic battlefield to be a good thing because when the enemies flank, you get the hell out of there. Now let's talk about Uncharted 4. Uncharted 4, the enemies in that game are almost too smart. The developers have designed these fantastically complex Escher-like paintings of, 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 of battle zones where there's four or five tiers of areas to climb, there's a million and one flank routes, there's a million and one doorways, there's waterways that lead out into other places. There's, there's, you are not safe from any angle except for one particular piece of cover seven years away at the bottom corner of the map. And even then, the grenades are coming, so you better have a ledge to cling off of, or you're dead. That's kind of how Uncharted 4 works. On crushing, when you're out of cover on Uncharted, the enemies are so devious, they were probably already flanking you by the time you moved out of cover, that the moment that you did, you were dead. Because there was two guys above you and you didn't even notice and there was a shotgunner that flanked you. And on that game, when somebody flanks you and gets that close to you, there is not a single thing you can do. That game has a combat role, or a, a, just a, like a, a, a fancy evade where, where Nathan will do a role, but it affords you almost no advantage at all, really. Because we do it to try and stay alive, we do it to be a harder target, but does it really make us much more of a harder target? Probably not. We do it because we think it makes us safer. It is not like the dodge that they have in this game. So when you do get flanked, which happens all the time because every single enemy in that game is aggressive enough to either get a higher ground to shoot down at you or to move to your side to shoot at you, the moment you get in a bad spot, you're dead. You cannot allow it to happen. So instead of having this idea of the entire battlefield being this active, constant threat where you're moving around and moving intelligently, you're never afforded that luxury in Uncharted 4 because you die too quickly. It changes it from an active battlefield to a kill box. And I know for, for a certain there'll be somebody who says that they can because this is YouTube and you're always wrong. And I believe it, I do. Because I know on my, my experience, my own empirical evidence when I've played, that there were times when I was able to navigate those battlefields and do really well, and then I would die from something else. But the main principal difference here, why I've praised it in this game, and in that game I didn't feel like it complemented it well, is 100% to do with how the levels were designed, and how the movement was designed. This game affords you so much more mobility than you will ever probably get in an Uncharted game. And that is why the idea of enemies flanking and constantly keeping you moving is good. Because if the moment you get out of cover, you immediately melt, then there's no point of being active at all. Because the only real safety is the cover. And uh, I, I explained it in a, a slightly different manner in the comment, but that's my reasonings for it. 
And I do think it's interesting because I love this idea that we're moving towards games where it's taking all these conventions that we've learnt and it's twisting them. I think that's really good. Because back in the day, uh, it was established that, you know, this is the enemy that sits in cover. This is the sniper enemy that makes you afraid to fight the other enemies. This is the enemy that rushes you. So if you see this enemy, you're not safe anymore. Very binary, isn't it? They do one thing or nothing, you know? When we get to the moment where everything is kind of that immersive random threat that, that has these different mannerisms and these different abilities, that's when the AI and that's when the difficulty gets really interesting. And that's the reason why Dark Souls is so good. If you've ever wondered why people like Dark Souls so much and they praise it so much, it's not necessarily because of anything too drastic, it's just because it never seems to go down the same way twice. And even if you know exactly what to do, and exactly how to manipulate the enemies and the bosses, they will always do something that surprises you. And it's that level of unpredictability that leads people to play that game as much as they do and enjoy it as much as they do. That's not even mentioning, you know, the whole host of replayability, the builds, the, the, the fantastic level design, the diverse areas, the bosses and everything. It's just that fundamental level of... A lot of games are willfully predictable, so you just find whatever nuance it is that you can exploit to win and you use that. Whereas in a Souls game, you can think you've got that and it, and it still gets you. And, and that's why it is so endearing and so interesting. And I'm hoping next generation doesn't just mean fancier, shinier graphics. You know, I'm hoping it means AI improvements. I want to get to the point where, you know, this stuff is so wonderfully complex that just fighting one enemy is like a boss because they're that interesting. And I always go back to the same thing with this because it's left a lasting impression in my memory. And that's fear. F-E-A-R. Like first encounter... Assault, Reconnaissance or something. It's the most ridiculous acronym ever. It's a horror first-person shooter game that's inspired by um, Chinese cinema, just inspired by John Woo. And it was made by Monolith. And I used to play it on PC. I got it for the PC at the time when I was a wee bairn. And that game was one of the most challenging games I'd ever played and one of the best. It's probably one of my all-time favourite first-person shooters because the, the feeling of shooting felt great, the slow motion felt great and all the unnecessary particle effects and doves and shit was amazing because it was super John Woo-y and that's exactly what I liked about John Woo myself because I was a massive fan of his when I was younger. So Fear was just everything I liked about the idea of a first-person shooter and then the AI was like nothing I'd ever played against. You came up against enemies that flanked you. You came up against enemies that panicked when you bumped into them and then they ran somewhere else. They did all kinds of interesting things. They put pressure on you in ways that enemies just didn't put pressure on you. And it led to these incredibly tense, terrifying gunfights. Because on the hardest difficulty, which I think on fear, wasn't it extreme difficulty? They could strip your shield and strip your HP in seconds. And that game didn't have re regenerating life like we do now. So you had to, to really know what you were doing, but it was always fair because the enemies came from very specific spawns so you could learn them and conquer them. Grenades were fantastic so you could preempt enemies and kill them that way. And then you had the slow motion, which was an amazing advantage. And you could do firefights on that game without taking damage. You can't do that in first person shooters normally, but in that game you could. And the AI will always stand out as a milestone because it went from, here's a, a really interesting simulation of whack-a-mole with bullets to, Jesus Christ, this guy is actively hunting me. And I'll never forget that, I, I won't. And there might have been other things that did it just as well at the time, or maybe better, like Halo was another one. I'm, you're never gonna hear me say too too many you know compliments when it comes to Halo, because I never liked the series. I think the games are fine, I don't think they're bad, I just never thought they were very good myself. And that's 100% personal, you know. I appreciate that people love Halo. I love arguing with my friends over it just to annoy them. But it was never something that I was 100% down with, because I just didn't see the appeal. But you know the one area that you cannot argue, even if you want to be a troll and be a dick and have, have a laugh annoying your friends, is the AI. The AI in Halo is really good. It's really different. It's evasive. It's cowardly. It does all these things that just didn't really exist in games before it, in a lot of ways. Like, some of the stuff in those games... It was, it was revolutionary in a lot of ways, especially for me. And, and once again, that's coming from somebody that played it and was like, okay, this is a big green field and now you want me to drive in it? Do I shoot things today? Like, what the fuck is this game? Like, I was not a fan at all. 
But the AI can't knock it. The level design can go fuck itself. Garbage. <laughs> but that's a different thing. Nah, I'm only playing, guys. You know, Halo it was kind of standardized first-person shooters on consoles. I was always very bitter about that because I came from GoldenEye and Perfect Dark and I loved those games and I just didn't see what everybody else saw. But when I moved my bias aside technologically, because we didn't have Half-Life, because we didn't have Unreal Tournament and, and all those other games, you know, that really, really redefined, like Soldiers of Fortune 2. There was a lot of really great PC games at that time that were dropping that were just, you know, super, super good. And if that was your barometer of quality, you would have played GoldenEye and been like, what the fuck is this Doom clone dog shit? Like, you might not have got it, but if your frame of reference was different, then it was something beautiful. But AI is, is something that really fascinates me, and I'm really looking forward to seeing where we go with it. Like, can you remember when... What was that game called? Spec Ops The Line. Anybody remember that one? I got in the beta for Spec Ops The Line because I was so obsessed with what that game looked like that I kept contacting the developers. <laughs> Because I was so curious about it. I loved the idea of of getting trapped in this area where the sand is constantly changing the environments and your team is coming up against all these kind of crazy, um, not only environmental problems and terrorist problems and like militia problems, but also psychological problems and the strain and the stress of everything. So I thought the idea of that was, was just wonderful. Really wonderful. I thought it was a fantastic idea. And then, you know, when they gave me the beta code, it was for the fucking multiplayer and the multiplayer was garbage. But you can't tell these people that you've been sucking the dick for so long that it's garbage. That'd be like spitting the load back in their face and they don't want that. So I was, I tried to find, you know, the quality that I could from it. But there was some real problems with that multiplayer. So I, I kind of just, you know, I mentioned things like, I think this gun does too much damage. I think this gun could have more ammunition so could it, it could be competitive with the other stuff. You know, I feel like the running feels like shit. You definitely need to, to make this feel better. The transition into cover doesn't feel smooth enough and it leads to getting very sticky cover situations. There was a whole host of problems. Like, the grenades were ridiculous. And I did all that and I was really excited for when the game came out. And then the game came out and none of the stuff that I thought was going to be really interesting AI-wise was relevant at all. There were some wonderfully fun, you know, fun and fantastic scripted moments where you did these things and it turned out they were innocents and you know everybody got fucked up and your team starts losing their way and, and getting all angry and aggressive with each other. And all of that stuff is thematically really interesting. But I expected the AI to, to, to be way more complex than it was. Like I thought there were going to be moments where you would bump into people and you wouldn't know whether or not they were hostile or not. And then there was going to be the option where you either start a firefight with them or you don't, and then later on there's the chance that they might betray you and things. So I thought it was going to be just this completely hostile environment in this crazy Dubai landscape, and it just it just wasn't. And that was my fault, that, you know. I would never judge the game against what I thought it was going to be, because that just seemed silly to me. And speaking of silly, we have another Ascendant, and once again I'm so terrified of the Ascendant that I just ran past him, because he's a giant pussy with an Aegis barrier of doom. The guy is just a straight cheater, and over there is an anointed who's actually... Oh no, it's not anointed, is he? Is he anointed or was he a destined? Yeah, there's an anointed there. It's kind of blurry. So I'm going to focus on the enemies that are a threat, and then we'll go after the uh, the privileged ivory tower douchebag over there. So get the team focused on these guys, push forward. This is a pretty big firefight as well, but I really like it because I don't think I've ever died on it. And that's because it's well designed. Like, it gives you all the cover you need, it gives you all the tools you need to move between areas effectively, and it gives you enough ammo to, to deal with most of it. It's just, once again, the Ascendant turns up and ruins everything, because he's a terribly designed enemy. But for most, I like this fight a lot. And that's one of the things I really appreciate these days, in, in especially third-person shooters. An area that you can get through on a hardest difficulty without dying, because everything you did complemented your advantage and you won because of it. Like how many times do you die in these kind of games because you got kind of bullshitted? Like somebody maybe flanked you and you tried to, to recover but you were in one of those positions where it's almost impossible. You know those moments where you kind of give up but at the same time you can survive them if you're lucky? Like every moment in a game where you have to rely on luck to survive, that's a, a teleportation. Interesting, he moved away from me. Why did he do that? He didn't even try and grab me. I'm offended. Do I smell? He's going after her, so I'm going to go and pick up Drac. But this is a testament to how shit this enemy is, that I can casually run around this battlefield not caring about him when he's meant to be legitimately the, the most dangerous opponent. Really, really strange. 
but any kind of environment where the firefight itself is, is, is perfectly acceptable, like it's well designed, it's a good firefight, but you get into one of those moments where you either get bad luck or you need to rely on luck to survive. Uh, those are the moments that I would like design to replace. Of course, there's always going to be an element of randomness, but I, I just like the idea of, of, of good play conquering. And I've been playing a lot of Dark Souls 3 recently, which makes me really think about that as we try and stunlock this guy with some punches. And it kind of does, but he still gets his shield back because it's a broken enemy. And there's his grab. Oh no, please don't hurt me with your terrible grab. There's a Destined who completely strips my shield, which is really scary, so get away from it. But look at my mobility. See what I mean? If you use skillful movement and you're good at moving around the environment quickly, you can get out of these situations even on insanity. You can't do this in the other Mass Effects. It doesn't exist. Like, you could do it in the multiplayer on Mass Effect 3, but that's because you had a dodge. And that's why, even though a lot of people hate this game and they're shitting on it, and it deserves to, you know, get a lot of criticism, it still has features that make it really fun. And some features that are better, objectively, than the other Mass Effects. It's just there are more that are worse, which is kind of sucky. I do find it interesting, this shotgun as well, when you hit fire, it just does not go where you aim it. It's, it's terrific. But it's kind of a balancing mechanic to make sure that it's not too strong because the, t the stats on this gun are off the chart. But as I was saying, playing Dark Souls 3 uh, recently, I've been doing essentially Soul Level 1 New Game plus 7 bosses. And at that point, everything that touches you kills you. And you have to hit them like 30 to 50 times. It turns a fight that you can do in a minute or two minutes into a five minute fight. Sometimes longer depending on how much the defense is. And it really teaches you that once you know that boss completely, the only thing left in it is kind of the RNG of what the boss does. And there are certain things a boss will do where if they sync it up perfectly and they do like the worst case scenario of things, getting out of that can be very difficult. So it comes to a point where you are skillfully avoiding 99% of everything they do. But if they do that one kryptonite move or that one kryptonite setup, there's almost nothing you can do. And that is an annoying thing, but at the same time, you understand that there's a reason why it's working. It's working because A, I haven't figured out a better way of, not, of it not working, or B, I put myself in a place where I allowed this to be a thing. So there's always reasons to it. Another reason is the boss could have used any move, but he chose the one I am not good at. And that's another factor that can kill you when you're trying to do these kind of difficult runs. Because you'll get to the end of a boss, you'll get him to 10% life left, you'll be maybe two or three hits away from the finish, and then the worst possible thing will happen. Like, all the planets will align, and they'll, they'll, they'll form a huge celestial phallus, and then they'll just jab you in the mouth with it. In the most poetic way, in a way that if the developers had scripted it, you wouldn't have even believed it then, because it was so perfectly designed. It's the kind of design that's so just perfect, so immaculate, so just horrendously sublime, that people would think you were making it up when it happens. And it happens so frequently. I had a moment in the, the, uh, the Black Flame Freed fight from the father of the Ashes of Ariandel DLC in Dark Souls 3, where... There's a move that that boss does where she fires ice across the ground when she's invisible. And then if you look for where the uh, like the, the ice flakes get cast when she jumps, it tells you what direction she goes in. So you follow her, and then she jumps again after casting ice at you. And after the second jump, whichever direction she goes in is where she's going to start charging a very powerful attack. By the way guys, this is that doorway that's a very hard firefight. Notice how I'm going to hug the, the left-hand side of this, and I'm going to use my team, and I'm going to use the door shutting as a safety net. This is a really tricky fight. It escalates quickly, but it also has a second phase that can be skipped, because for whatever reason the designers didn't want you to fight a cool phase, which is really confusing.